Matthew chapter 27 and verse 11 says, And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. Verse 26, Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And when they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head and after they had mocked him they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him the trial of Jesus is now over he has now been condemned to die by the cowardly Pilate he is now handed over to the calloused Roman soldiers to be abused and tortured and then executed. They took Jesus first and they scourged him. And that's where they take the victim, Jesus, in this case. They lay his back bare and then they tie his hands to a post. And a large strapping Roman soldier would take that whip of several strands intertwined with pieces of bone and metal and he would rear back and he would lay that whip across the bare back of Jesus yes. and with every blow the flesh of Jesus would be torn open and a new river of blood would begin Jewish law limited scourging to 39 lashes the Roman soldier was not bound by Jewish law or custom and he mercilessly beat the back of our Lord until the flesh hung in ribbons and doubtlessly looked like raw meat. Many a criminal, many a victim died from the scourging alone. But when they had scourged Jesus, these soldiers took him and they dragged him into the common hall. And there they stripped him of his meager clothes and they put on his back a robe, not a purple robe of royalty, but a scarlet robe showing what they thought of him mocking him and his claims of being a king they spat on him they made fun of him they mocked him they beat him over his precious head with clubs and in the midst of all of this some soldier callously and famously grabbed a thorny branch and he quickly and crudely wove together a crown and he thrust it upon the head of Jesus. Those sharp thorns, those sharp thorns as they were thrust into the tender temple and brow of the Savior, with every thorn opened up a new stream of blood. Now they did that to the Lord in sheer mockery. Jesus had claimed to be the king of the Jews. They didn't believe he was a king. They rejected him as king. They ridiculed the very idea that he was the king of the Jews. He was a laughing stock to these Roman soldiers who had no interest in the religion of the Jews. But to look at this man, especially as he now was, and to think that he could be a king, the things he said certainly didn't sound like the, thing, uh, the things a king would say. He didn't look like a king. And so to them, Jesus was the object of their mockery. And as they now bowed their knees and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, they were outright mocking Jesus Christ. Well, what a picture that is for Isaiah 700 years before Jesus was even born. 700 years before Jesus was ever born. Pictured the suffering Savior that day, being scourged and beaten, crowned with a thorny crown, and finally crucified. And he so famously said in Isaiah 52 and verse 14, Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. That's how the New International Version renders that verse. Literally meaning that these soldiers, when they had finished with Jesus, he didn't even look like a human being. He bore ghastly scars. 
And every last one of them was a symbol of our salvation and the price for our sins. Now, I don't believe that any of that was happenstance. Nothing that happened to Jesus that day happened without being prefigured and being ordained of God. Jesus was acting out the divine drama of the ages. He's not a helpless victim as he stands here before Pilate and he's handed over, and as he's handed over to these soldiers. He is acting out the divine drama of the ages. And even when that soldier, probably as an afterthought, took and snapped off that branch and wove together that crown and thrust it down on his head to make fun of Jesus, he didn't stop and think about what he was doing and the significance and the import of what he was doing to Jesus. But there is a divine picture, there's a sacred shadow that is revealed to us, if you please, when Jesus was crowned with the crown of thorns. The very first rose that grew on the earth grew without a thorn. Thorns were not created with the world in the beginning, but thorns came about because of the sin of man. And the very crown of thorns that Jesus would wear is a direct result of sin upon the human race. And it's a very painful reminder as we read the crucifixion account of why Jesus had to die. Genesis chapter 3 tells us that after man's sin, God cursed man, he cursed woman, he cursed the serpent, and he cursed the earth, he cursed the ground. And the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3 verses 17 through 19 that he not only told the woman that she would have pain in childbearing, but he told the serpent that he would crawl upon his belly and eat the dust of the earth and he told the man that he would work and he would toil all the days of his life for the bread that he would eat and he said that the ground would bring forth thorns and thistles and it would make his existence and his job upon this earth difficult thorns came about as a result of the curse man's sin cursed this world and you know had adam never sinned thorns would have never grown but now jesus is wearing the crown because he is bearing the curse and those thorns that pierce his brow speak of the hardship and the toil and the pain and the sorrow and the suffering of a ruined creation. Adam, the first Adam, brought death and travail upon the earth. And even today, the earth is full of tragedy and it is full of vexing problems and it is full of suffering and death. The Bible teaches us that the whole creation, in fact, is corrupted. Romans chapter 8 and verse 22, Paul reminds us that we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And so suffering and death rest upon every living thing that God has made. But why? Why? That's one of the great mysteries in the mind of man almost since the beginning of time. Why do we live in a world that is full of such pain and suffering? Why does God allow these things to be? Paul tells us why in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 when he says, For as by one man, the first Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. It's all the result of sin that corrupted an otherwise perfect world that was in fellowship and harmony and, and, and communion with God. And look at Job's conclusion in Job 14 and 1. Man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. And so every man, even today, all of us, that we feel the thorns of sickness and disease and sorrow and tragedy and ultimately death. Even the Apostle Paul referred to his adversity and his trial in life as a thorn in the flesh. So you see, when Jesus was crowned with thorns, he was wearing our crown. When Jesus was wearing the crown of thorns, he was wearing a symbolic crown, a crown that was woven with our sin. Now let's think about the meaning in that crown when it comes to our salvation. The crown tells us that the curse that was on us was instead suffered by the sinless head of the Savior. In other words, he was our substitute. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, For he hath made him to be sin, or a sin offering for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God made him to bear our penalty. That's what Calvary is all about. God made him to pay the price that our sin incurred, that is death. He knew no sin. He committed no sin. He was not worthy of such punishment. He was perfectly righteous. But despite his righteous life, despite the fact that he never violated the will of God, despite the fact that he never committed sin, he was sinless, pure, perfect, holy, and righteous. Despite all of that, God allowed him to become a sin offering for you and for me. Yes. 
Don't ever forget that a holy God is bound, bound by his own divine nature to punish sin. That's what the gospel is all about. A price must be paid for every sin we commit. God doesn't forgive a sinner on a whim. God doesn't just decide because of the merit of an individual that he's going to just overlook or forgive his sin. A price must be paid for every sin. Every sin exacts a price. It must be paid in order to satisfy a holy and righteous God and therefore the need for a sacrifice. And we could either die as a result of our sin or there could be one who could stand in our stead, who could die in our place. So that instead of uh, us bearing the penalty, he would bear the penalty and it would be paid. And Jesus is showing us that he is bearing the curse as he wears this crown of thorns upon his head. Jesus, eternal, coexistent, and co-equal with God, came down and took on the form of flesh and of blood. He took part of the same, as the Hebrew writer tells us, that we, he, be, uh, he became as we are, that through death he would destroy the devil who has the power of death. That is, in order to destroy and defeat death, Jesus had to become one of us so that he could become a vicarious sacrifice or substitute and die in our place. Thus, the debt could be paid. Death could be destroyed. Sin could be defeated. When Jesus was robed and crowned by those soldiers, friends, he was wearing the crown that belonged to us. I want you to think about something that is absolutely thrilling. Here's our sacred shadow. Where was Jesus on this day? Jesus was standing on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem this day. He was standing in one of the most significant places in history. Mount Moriah was a famous place. In fact, one of the great prophecies of all time, one of the most vivid and graphic types and portrayals of Calvary took place on this very mountain. <laughs> At this very place where Jesus now humbly stands with a crown of thorns upon his head more than 2,000 years before, 2,000 years before, there was another scene that unfolded there that's recorded in Genesis, the 22nd chapter. It tells us, of course, how Abraham took his son Isaac as he obeyed God. He led his son up the slope of Mount Moriah to offer to God a burnt offering. To offer a sacrifice. God put in the hands of Isaac a knife, the wood, they had the fire, and they start up the side of this mountain and Isaac begins to look and he says, Father, I don't understand. You have the fire. We have the wood, we have a knife, we have everything that's needed to offer a sacrifice, but where's the lamb? You know the story. And Abraham, doubtlessly choking back tears, answered Isaac, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. They take the wood with them up the mountain to build an altar for the burnt offering. And then came that dreaded and that awful moment when everything was ready. And Abraham turns to Isaac and he says, son, you're going to be the offering. God's required you. And he takes Isaac, his beloved son, and he lays him on that altar in an unwavering faith. He raises the knife, and as the blade flashes in the sun, the voice of God's angel cried out, and he said, Abraham, don't hurt him, stop. I now know that you believe. I now know that you have faith. He had passed the test. And now God would provide the sacrifice. The Bible tells us that Abraham lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. I'm told that that word thicket there literally means a thicket of thorns. And Abraham goes and he takes that ram and doubtlessly with thorns still protruding from its head. And its coat, its rack, he takes and he lays that ram on the altar. 
and he sacrifices it in the place of his own son. We have the sacred shadow of substitutionary redemption and sacrifice at the very place where 2,000 years later now Jesus would stand with a crown of thorns thrust in his head to be our substitute, to be our sacrifice. How can people say the Bible is not a divine book? How can people say that all scripture is not given by inspiration of God? No wonder Jesus said in John 8 and verse 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and he was glad. Let me tell you something else interesting about that. You know, Abraham was quite an altar builder. We read of several occasions where Abraham built altars. In fact, if you trace his life beginning in Genesis chapter 12, that trail is dotted with various altars he built to the Lord along the way. When God promised to give his people the land of Canaan, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7 that he built an altar there. And then in verse 8, we're told that he went a little ways and camped near Bethel and he built an altar there. And then in Genesis chapter 13, after he separates from Lot, he settles there in Hebron and he built an altar there. And perhaps he built other altars that the Bible does not tell us about. But then he comes to Mount Moriah and he builds the altar where God provides the substitute for Abraham's own flesh and blood. Where he provides the substitute that was the foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And interestingly after that we never read of Abraham building another altar. What a wonderful and sacred shadow of the cross. For Jesus Christ on the cross offered once all sufficient all atoning never to be repeated sacrifice for our sins he paid it all he paid the debt he wore our crown he became our offering he became our sacrifice and as i close tonight because he was willing to wear our crown of thorns on that day long ago today he wears another crown John in Revelation pictures him in Revelation 14 and verse 14. And, lo, and I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one that sat like unto the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. There have been some very significant crowns in the history of the world. I'm told that the crown of Queen Elizabeth is the most famous and valuable crown in the world. It contains, I'm told, five rubies, 17 sapphires, 11 emeralds. It's adorned with 273 pearls and 2,868 diamonds. But it's a trinket next to the crown of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because out of the midst of that thorny crown that he wore long ago as he stood in ridicule and mockery on Mount Moriah that morning grew the Rose of Sharon. And out of that ugly and miserable crown woven by those soldiers bloomed the rose of peace. And when he conquered sin, Satan, and hell and was swept up into glory and sat down at the right hand of God, a crown, a coronation took place in the halls of heaven and a crown was placed upon his head, a crown that was rightfully his, a crown that he deserved, a crown that he had earned, a crown that was not yours nor mine, nor one that he was wearing for us. That crown was placed upon his head. It is his and his alone. It wasn't placed there in mockery. It was placed there in victory. And he will wear that crown until the day he comes again and he delivers up the kingdom to God. Now I want to ask you a very personal and decisive question as we close out this old year and we get ready to embark upon a new year with its prospects and its challenges. And this night causes us to stop and inspect our lives and to do serious introspection of our souls. In the lives that we're living do you crown Jesus as Lord and King of your life or have you thrust the thorny crown of mockery and insincere worship upon his head you say I would never do what the Roman soldiers did I would never mock Jesus when you pay lip service to Jesus and you call him king, but you don't let him rule your life. You place a crown of mockery on the head of Jesus. Right. History tells us of the pious Queen Victoria. Linwood used to tell this story. I used to love, him. He love to hear him tell it. That one day she was listening to her preacher, Dr. F.W. Farrar. And he happened to be talking, he was such an eloquent man, if you never read the book, The Life of Christ, it is of course a classic work on the 
chronicles of the life of the Lord Jesus, one of those beautiful depictions of the life of Jesus that you'll ever read aside from the inspired gospel accounts. He was the chaplain or the preacher where Queen Victoria was attending worship. And on this particular day, he was preaching about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Queen Victoria was greatly moved by his sermon and she summoned him up to the royal box and it said that when Dr. Farrar approached, the queen was brushing away tears and she said, you preached a wonderful sermon today. And it made me so wish that I could be sitting on the throne of this great nation when Jesus Christ comes again because I'd love to take the crown of this kingdom and I'd love to, love to lay it at his nail pierced feet. Well, that's a beautiful thought. And such perhaps is a window into her heart and her soul and her reverence for the Lord Jesus. But the fact of the matter is, her crown really doesn't mean much to Jesus. And you and I certainly don't have glittering crowns of gold to lay at his feet. We don't have glittering crowns of jewels to give to Jesus. Nor is Jesus really interested in such crowns. But there is something that we do have. We have a sinful, scarred life that we can humbly give to him and say, here is all that I have and all that I am, and you take and make it what you want it to be. What kind of crown are you placing on the head of the Savior today? Do you honor him as King of kings and Lord of lords? Have you ever submitted to him in obedience to the gospel, allowing him to be your sacrifice, your offering for sin? No other offering will do. Only the offering of Jesus can pay the debt that your sin has incurred. And won't you, in exchange for what he has done for you, come and give to him all that you have? He gave you his all when he became your substitute, when he wore that crown of thorns. Would you not come and bow before him and give him all that you have by obeying his word, becoming his disciple, surrendering your life and your all to him?